Terry, you bring to the study of language a unique perspective. I've looked at language my whole life. I come from a neuroscience background. You bring the two together, and I, I really want to understand it in depth, uh, how uh, language develops and communications among living things develops, and your theory is as, as a core concept of, of symbols and signs, semiotics, how it relates to brain development. So you bring those two together in a unique way, and that uh, is a, 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 a way to really understand what language really is, a unique approach. I'm looking forward to hearing it. Well, the key to this has to do with thinking of language not as something in and of itself, but, but actually seeing it as a special case of semiotic communication in general, which includes um, communication by likeness, by similarity of, of appearance, uh, communication by virtue of correlation among physical processes or temporal correlation. And then um, language is a special case of symbolic communication. Now, what we've done to some extent is collapse the notion of symbol into just simple correlation. Uh, and uh, one of the things we've done in linguistics is to ignore all of the other modes of communication that are, of course, underneath language. I call it the infrastructure of language uh, that language depends upon. But language is unique, and this is why it's only evolved in one species mm. at one point in time, uh, and, and quite late in the process, using a brain that's not radically different than other brains. Uh, and so the real question is how this new kind of software gets instantiated in a brain. Um, the challenge is that symbolic communication um, is not just simple correlation. Um, and the key there is that, of course, words aren't related to things in the world by virtue of their sound or their similarity. <laughs> right, right. And people have known this, of course, forever. Um, the question is how do you acquire uh, a way of referring to things uh, in which all the surface correlations and correspondences aren't there. And the answer is it has to be built up. And so every child, of course, has to build this up. Uh, in the course of our evolution, we had to build it up as well. But that means that, in a sense, brains have to be used in a different way. Um, we have to build up the capacity. We sometimes call this relationship conventional. Uh, but if you think about a convention where people agree to things, mm -hmm. it's not because they've actually agreed most of the time. Nobody agreed that words would mean certain things. Uh, it just sort of happened. Conventions happen by virtue of paying attention to patterns of behavior um, among each other, pointing to things, referring to things, sharing things, and so on. All of that, of course, precedes the appearance of language for children. Mm. Um, and children have to use that semiotic background, as it's called, uh, to build up the capacity for language. Um, the key to my work has been recognizing that to do this requires thinking in different ways, using our brains slightly differently. Uh, and so I, I think about language evolution as a co-evolutionary process in which language has restructured the way our brains work. Uh, that brains are anatomically slightly different because of the special demands that symbolic reference requires. And what are some of those specific differences? Because we see so much uh, homology between the brains of, right. of humans and, uh, and, and the higher primates, uh, for sure. Uh, and we see uh, other species, elephants, cetaceans, whales, for example, which uh, you've collected brains that are much bigger than, than human brains uh, in, in every dimension. So what is it physiologically, uh, anatomically, neurohistologically, or, or, or uh, system-wise in the brain that, that differs, that enables that language communication? So first of all, that we don't have all the answers. There's still a lot to be learned here. And some of it may be molecular, some of it may be um, having the result of, of just different strengths of neurotransmitters and so on. We don't know all those details, but what we do know is that in the enlargement of the human brain, not everything enlarged as a piece. It's not like blowing up a balloon. Mm -hmm. um, and this has to do with how evolution works. It doesn't sort of build a, a, one adult brain to produce another kind of adult brain. Brains have to be built up from cells, and those con connections between the cells have to be established. It's a kind of almost microevolutionary process mm -hmm, in mm -hmm. which new connections are established mm -hmm. by virtue of competing with each other. 
and competing on the basis mostly of uh, the relative sizes of parts. So that if one part is sending connections to another part, if one of those parts enlarges or reduces, um, it's going to change the competition for connectivity. Mm -hmm. One of the things that happened as human brains enlarged, um, the connectivity changed. So one of the major connection differences, for example, is that it's made possible what I'm doing right now. That is precisely timing the movement of my lips, tongue, uh, and, and jaw with the production and cessation of production of air breathing mm -hmm. and, and of the tension of the muscles of my larynx. It's really complicated if you think about it. It's really complicated, but the key is that in other species, um, the cerebral cortex, which controls a lot of the, what you might call intentional motor movements, yeah. does control the mouth, the tongue, the lips, and so on, but does not control the larynx and breathing. Hmm. Uh, what's happened in humans is that because of the enlargement of the cerebral cortex, um, areas of motor cortex have sent their axons, their output connections down to the brainstem, an area called the nucleus ambiguous mm. of all things. That it's, it's the area that connects mostly to these sort of more automatic functions uh, and is now competing with the, those systems that control our mm. sound making uh, automatically. So laughter and sobbing is still produced. Um, mm. But we find this competition showing up, for example, when um, you're, you're, we're talking along and suddenly a, a funny idea pops into my head. Uh, oftentimes laughter can you know, in, interfere with my vocalizations. Yeah, right. Or if I'm very upset, you, 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 you can tell because my right. vocalizations have changed. Right, yeah. um, it's because right. they're now competing for controlling of the larynx uh, mm. and the breathing. And that, that doesn't happen in other species. It doesn't happen in part because we want those systems to work automatically. We don't want to have to think about sure. them. Uh, and so it's only in the human brain where this enlargement of the cerebral cortex compared to this deep brain structure has caused connections to be slightly different in proportions developmentally. Uh, and this has made this capacity to precisely time everything because now we have a, an, an automatic system that's also being controlled by, uh, in a sense, a volitional system. Okay, clearly that's right and, and works, no argument there. But here's a, a kind of a counter way of thinking about it. Uh, obviously, language and the ability to think in language is cerebral cortex uh, uh, dominated, if not totally uh, resident. And we know that uh, uh, animals with larger brains, even though proportionally the the uh, human cerebral cortex proportionally is much larger compared to other species. The gross amount of cerebral cortex in, in an elephant or certainly in a whale in the cetaceans is more. So they have more cerebral cortex. Now maybe if the fine movement of larynx is not there, if there are fish in the water, maybe they can communicate in language with fin movements, a sign language. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, people who are deaf have sign languages, right, right, and, exactly. and they and they would, you know, some militant sign languages would say, "I don't want a cochlear implant because it interrupts the art artistry right, right. of my elegant sign language." If you watch sign, you know, signers, it's very artistic and very right, right. beautiful. It's like a calligraphy because they have their own expression. So language can be done in non. Ways that you don't need a larynx. So if a whale has a large cerebral cortex, larger than ours, and it has some vehicles for non-verbal languages, and of course it has tones of kind, maybe it's their their own language. Well, so I interestingly enough, it's one of the ideas that was presented to me by a kid, a, a seven-year-old, eight-year-old, um, in which I was telling my son's class. Uh, you know, what I do, what daddy does for work, right? And uh, one of the kids piped up and said, yeah, but, but bees and dogs have bee language and dog language. And I had to say, well, no, it's not quite the same. Language is very unique. And it's unique in the way that it represents things in the world. Yeah. Uh, and that's what we're getting at, even though we produce it in sound. I think that's a special case of just how easy it is to copy sounds. And that that's one of the things that was dragged along. But but okay. I think the key to this has to do with the nature of symbols yes. okay. and how symbols Absolutely. refer to things. Right. And, and are, you, are we saying then that humans are the only symbol uh, uh, um, using creature? The only, uh, that doesn't mean that other creatures can't learn, um, but they need a great deal of support to get even a little bit of symbolic communication. 
In humans, part of the thing that's happened is our cerebral cortex is restructured a little bit. Um, that is along with these size differences. Different subsections of the cerebral cortex have enlarged with respect to each other. Mm -hmm. One of those areas is what is the prefrontal cortex. Mm -hmm. uh, the prefrontal cortex is very critically involved in processes that, in, that require us to sort of keep track of alternatives. Yeah, it's one of the only areas of the brain, or one of the major areas of the brain that has no specific function. It's not motor, it's not sensory, it's not hearing, it's not visual. It has uh, in, an integrated function, but the frontal lobes generally have to do with the future planning and kind right. of uh, We sometimes sensory. call it executive function. Yeah, and personality, yeah. And, uh, aspects like that. And uh, so you, you find language resonant there as well as in the you so know, very think, specific, there's very specific areas for language and you know you can have different different language deficits where you can't understand or you can't speak and there are aphasia, diff, different things that they'd be different parts of the brain affected. But those are the very specific areas. Well so here's what's interesting is that since, since we've begun to use these new techniques like functional fMRI, yeah. we've begun to realize that actually the cere whole cerebral cortex motor areas, sensory areas, areas involved in even emotionality um, play a significant role in understanding the meanings of words. Oh. Um, so that although historically we've recognized that there were sort of crucial focal areas, sometimes called Broca's area and Wernicke's area, mm -hmm. uh, that when damaged actually produce uh, losses of input and output capacities. Um, they're not so crucial for understanding the meanings of words. Mm. Uh, and and as we've now begun to realize, what's happened is that, that language has to some extent recruited almost all areas of cerebral cortex. Yeah. Whereas in other species, and for us in laughter and sobbing and shrieks of, of fright and so on, uh, it's, not, it's not cortical at all. It's controlled subcortically. Oh, yeah. And so what's happened is that it's migrated up, so to speak. And I think it's migrated up in part because we've changed the relationships between those parts. Mm. And that now, I, I like to describe the human brain as front heavy. <laughs> um, that is, the kind of things that the, the prefrontal cortex does is it got its finger in more pies. Uh, yeah. And so it organizes these combinatorial relationships yeah. uh, that are necessary for language because language requires combinations in part because word meanings refer to each other. Word meanings don't refer directly to anything in the world, mm -hmm. but they refer to each other. Yeah. Uh, this is why a thesaurus works, for example, mm -hmm. uh, that it's a bunch of pointers from one word to another word to another word to another mm -hmm. word. Um, you need that sort of combinatorial capacity. But if you don't have that, you can't even get started. Yeah, which is why language is such a powerful vehicle to understand not just language itself as a, as a, as a thing, but it really the totality of, the, of, the men, of mental life. Uh, exactly. It, it's really a wonderful insight into that. Well, so I, I like to think of the example of two chimpanzees meeting for the first time as they cross from one a group to another group. Um, they can communicate their emotionality, their fears, and so on by their gestures and their vocalizations. But the one can't tell the other what just happened to me. Mm -hmm. Can't tell the other, you know, how I grew up, what I want to do. Um, we live our lives in each other's heads mm -hmm. to some extent, you know, in a way that's absolutely completely unparalleled with any other species. So that um, my thoughts have been affected by d dozens of my teachers, hundreds of of scientists and philosophers historically, um, my thoughts are, are, are Aristotle's thoughts to mm -hmm. some extent. And at the moment as, that we're talking, we're sharing our experiences uh, in ways, sharing our memories and mm -hmm. our, our beliefs and our expectations in ways that no other species can. That's only possible because we're referring to things symbolically. Um, because they're not immediately present, not immediate likenesses, not immediate correlations, but because this displacement from reference that symbols give us uh, allows us to now sort of um, do things that are impossible otherwise, to refer to the possi possible, to refer to what you're thinking and I'm thinking, um, to communicate our past memories or dreams or whatever. Um, this is something that means that all of us are in some respect, um, I like to describe us as a eusocial symbolic mm -hmm. species. Mm -hmm because we can't think without each other. We can't acquire language in this whole use of the brain unless we're in a social group in which language has already been developed. Uh, but because of that, um, we are completely dependent upon this capacity. 
we are like bees that require somebody else to reproduce for them. Mm -hmm. um, we require a whole society in order to think, a whole history in order to think. Um, this makes us uh, radically unlike any other species.